All right, so I'm going to pick back up with femoral neck fractures. Uh, in the last set of slides, we went through uh, some of the uh, basic uh, blood supply issues, uh, Powell's classification, right, one, two, and three, with three being that high uh, vertical shear type uh, unfavorable uh, situation seen often in young uh, healthy trauma patients. And then sort of the bimodal distribution with young trauma patients versus elderly patients, elderly getting them from osteoporosis younger patients from high energy trauma, and then the need to uh, get these reduced and fixed urgently uh, to prevent osteonecrosis if you're going to fix them, and um, the fact that anatomic reduction is really, really important because these will not heal with a lot of callus. They're intracapsular fractures bathed in fluid, and uh, if you don't have good compression and good uh, cortical contact, uh, these often can fail and collapse. Uh, I also mentioned that um, ORF can be done with uh, three parallel screws, but uh, a device like this, shown here um, uh, with a sliding hip screw and derotational screw, is biomechanically uh, more superior. So, uh, so let's pick up here. So compression hip screws, uh, they, it is a much bigger device. You put this huge screw in there, it sacrifices more bone. Uh, it is biomechanically superior. Uh, it's more likely to prevent varus collapse than just having three screws. Um, it's uh, something that you absolutely should have some type of derotational pins at least when you're instrumenting and putting that big lag screw in and uh, having a, a derotational screw that's parallel at the end is uh, often helpful as well. Um, uh, I would uh, argue that um, that this may not necessarily be uh, true. I think this is a little bit controversial. Um, that uh, it has no clinical advantage over parallel screws. Um, I think both can work, uh, but I think uh, you can see more failures uh, with the parallel screws in certain circumstances, so it's debatable. Open reduction internal fixation uh, is sometimes accompanied by uh, a uh, release of this hematoma. So some people feel that when you have this intracapsular hematoma with a femoral neck fracture um, that you get this increased pressure uh, that can uh, therefore um, um, cause pressure on the on the vessels that are supplying the femoral head and that you should do a capsulotomy uh, to release that pressure. Okay, now um, the the pressure in there is also sensitive to some to some degree uh, with uh, the hip uh, positioning. Um, so if you're on the OR table for a long period of time, then that that can contribute to this as well. But many people uh, recommend that you just go in and do like what's called a capsulotomy. You slide a hemostat in there, or if you're open, then you don't have to worry about it. You're already open the capsule, uh, but um, that maybe can help decrease that pressure. Let's talk about a little bit about um, arthroplasty versus ORIF. So ORIF is an option in elderly patients. Uh, I think you see arthroplasty done much more often for displaced fractures. Uh, you have to decide is the patient really elderly or not, right? If the patient's like 90 years old, I think most people would agree that's elderly. If the patient is 60 years old, I don't know. What is that? It depends maybe on what that kind of medical problems the patient has. Uh, you know, the patient could also be 70 and potentially very active uh, and um, had a fracture falling off their bike or something like that. So, um, so you know, the, the, the problem is that uh, with ORAF, uh, there is a uh, reasonable, um, or I shouldn't say good reasonable, but there's a sizable uh, risk of non-union and osteonecrosis. Um, so if you do fix these patients, you know, you, we do quote these numbers to patients and say, well, listen, maybe it's better that we replace it because the risk of having problems is fairly high. How these numbers were achieved uh, is a matter of debate because many of the studies that looked at these, these fractures were not anatomically reduced. Uh, they had perhaps minimal fixation, two screws or something like that, and a minimally in, in, in an improperly reduced fracture, and then you get a non-union or osteonecrosis. So um, it's debatable as to whether or not we've come to these numbers through studies that didn't really look at uh, very rigorous 
attempts at uh, reduction and fixation. So that said, um, still, it's very demanding and there is a risk of complications if you try to uh, fix the elderly patient's uh, femoral neck fracture. So we often just toss it in the trash and go to arthroplasty. Um, again, this is for displaced fractures. Um, so hemiarthroplasty means you just replace the femoral head, you leave the acetabulum. Uh, in many studies, this does better uh, than ORAF. Um, gets these patients up and walking. Um, there are unipolars, which means like you just have a fixed femoral head uh, versus bipolar, which the femoral head is a bipolar construct. Um, some studies have really shown that there's no significant difference. The only thing that's obviously different is the unipolars are cheaper. Um, so, uh, you know, your low cost uh, modular unipolar uh, stem uh, is fine for most of these femoral neck fractures, uh, although some surgeons feel more comfortable with bipolar uh, implants. Um, what about comparison of ORF to uh, replacement? Well, I kind of already mentioned that, um, uh, you know, patients who uh, are uh, at risk of osteonecrosis, who you don't want to have to operate on again and again. Um, why would you put a patient through, uh, you know, uh, something that has an eight times more likely uh, risk for having to have another surgery uh, than just replacing them and being done with it? The other thing is uh, you should keep in keep in mind total hip arthroplasty. I'm not going to get too much into this. This is still controversial um, in elderly but very, very active patients, total hips may be better because um, bipolars and unipolars or basically or hemiarthroplasties have a higher risk of wearing through the acetabulum. Okay, so it's almost like you have three options with these. Do you fix them? Do you do a hemi or do you do a total? And I think with the young, young active patients, you fix them. With the uh, elderly active patients, you can think about doing a total hip, and for the elderly sedentary patients, uh, hemiarthroplasty can do well for displaced femoral neck fractures. I think that's a reasonable rule of thumb. A few words about stress fractures. Uh, get a good history. Um, uh, this can be related to, uh, like with any stress fractures, it's either uh, normal stress on abnormal bone, Okay, or it's abnormal stress on normal bone. Okay, and um, so if you have a patient who is um, running, uh, carrying uh, packs, uh, so military recruits are sort of the prototypical example, uh, and they're not used to it and they're doing a ton of it, their risk for stress fractures because of abnormal stress. Or the patient who has um, uh, bone mineral disease and uh, is doing normal activity but their their bone is now not normal. They're at risk for stress fractures because of normal stress on abnormal bone. Alright, so that's how I think about stress fractures in general. And then you treat them by either decreasing the stress or um, uh, if you need to, addressing the issue with the bone if that's possible. Females are more common uh, of getting these uh, due to uh, amenorrhea, eating disorders, female athlete triad. Um, uh, as I mentioned, increased stresses, like an increase in athletic activity, uh, can cause this, distance runners. Um, and the femoral neck, this will present with activity or uh, weight-bearing related pain, groin pain. Obviously, you've got to rule other things out. It's not going to be that obvious on x-ray. Uh, there are so-called compression-sided fractures. So um, if, uh, if this is your uh, femoral neck, femoral head and neck, Right, so uh, a compression-sided fracture would occur here. Okay. Um, supposedly, some people feel that this is a safer uh, side of the uh, femoral neck to deal with because it's on the compression side, and potentially this can heal. Whereas a tension side uh, stress fracture would occur more up here. Okay, so so tension side compression side uh, and then 
most people feel the tension side is more risky. Uh, of course, a stress fracture could also, you know, complete all the way through and become displaced. I would advocate that I think any stress fracture in the femoral neck is at risk for displacement and probably should be fixed. Okay, but I think everybody would agree the tension sides are, are scarier. Um, uh, if you treat these non-operatively, you're, you're putting the patient at significant risk. If it displaces, they will do poorly. So you fix them. A couple words about femoral neck non-unions. Um, you know, this is the, these can occur. Obviously, they're more likely in the displaced fractures. Increased incidence with posterior comminution. Uh, you know, increased initial displacement, inadequate reduction, and non-compressive fixation. So, what I mean by uh, inadequate reduction would be like uh, you know, femoral neck's just poorly reduced, right? So you have the inferior or the distal portion here, and you're this is exaggerated, but just to give an example, I mean the femoral neck's just not well reduced. Non-compressive fixation, um, locked plate. So you, you fix something with fixed angle locked plate uh, fixation. These do poorly. Okay, uh, you have to compress these in order to get them to heal. Um, varus. Okay, fixing them. Uh, having a high shear angle and allowing it to fall into varus, uh, which can happen with uh, screw-only fixation, uh, puts the patient at risk for non-union. So here you can see, maybe it was reduced, it's certainly not anymore. Uh, remember I said in the, it's an intracapsular location in here, you're not going to get good callus formation. If you don't have good co cortical contact and compression, um, these can collapse. And these do not do well. Okay, This patient will be disabled if this is not addressed. Um, to identify this, CT scan is really helpful. It shows lack of healing. Um, MRI, plus or minus, you know, with all those stainless screws in there, sometimes you really can't tell. Uh, it may be difficult to assess how, um, how uh, you know, viable the head is. I'll come back here. So in order to address this, remember, if, this, if you consider this to be, you know, sort of there's a high shearing angle here, Okay, the femoral neck. To address this, what you got to do is you got to convert this to compressive forces. So, so-called uh, Powell osteotomy or um, intertrochanteric osteotomy. You would actually, you know, come in here and uh, take like a wedge out and can and then basically allow this to compress by taking a wedge out and then you put in a sliding hip screw or blade device that goes up and allows this angle to now come down to a more compressive angle, right? I can't show the whole thing without drawing everything and the preoperative planning steps, but that's how a non-union can be addressed with fixation. Now, of course, in an elderly patient with a non-union, you may decide to just replace it, but in a younger patient, um, this can be addressed with uh, with uh, osteotomy and fixation by converting it into a compressive force. Um, osteonecrosis uh, also happens uh, as well. So it's different than AVN, right? This is when you lose the blood supply and it, the head collapses, okay? Um, and uh, a devastating problem uh, in the elderly patient, you'll have to go on to a total hip. In the young patient, if it does really poorly and the head collapses, you may also have to go on to a total hip. Okay, so um, this is why we uh, try to get these reduced uh, early on. This is try to, why we try to uh, make sure we can you know, maintain reduction, get a good reduction. All right, so I think that's mostly what you need to know about uh, femoral neck fractures, some of the key points at least. Uh, thank you very much.